honoring Jerry and to reminisce about our friendship of many years. I thank the organizers of this event for inviting me to this meeting. But first of all, let me congratulate Jerry and his collaborators and competitors for the well-deserved and long overdue recognition of work which made the standard model possible. He got the uh, Sakurai Prize. I see it is Murphy. Yeah, I guess it is Murphy. For elucidating the. What is this in Greek? I'm burning up. So I expect that the award of the Sakurai Prize for elucidating the properties of spontaneous symmetry breaking will initiate a shower of further awards. So let's congratulate each other. That's okay. It's just a tail of probably just slide the whole thing over on the table a little bit and be fine. <laughs> My first contact with Jerry was in 1968 when I was a postdoc at CERN and he was already a professor at Brown. At that time, theoretical particle physicists were most interested in the symmetries of elementary particles and of the theories offered in their description. Particularly intense study was devoted to the dynamics of pi mesons because they realized the putative symmetries in the cleanest and simplest fashion. But at that time I was young and obstreperous and I set myself the program of finding fault in the accepted lore. And after a while I was delighted to discover an apparent inconsistency in a popular model for pi meson dynamics. I wrote a paper about my results and impatiently waited for permission from my CERN mentors to publish. One had to get permission to publish in those days if one were a visitor. So this is the paper. And um, Eventually permission came, but I didn't publish because as you can see, I show you only a preprint and not a reprint of my paper. This is a typical CERN, typical CERN preprint and, and it was circulated as a preprint but not as a reprint, and, but not as a published paper. And the reason that I didn't publish is because I received from Jerry a letter with the news you can't see it too clearly there but right there well, I have another version of it that you can see better he wrote to me at CERN to advise me that he thought the paper was very interesting however I had overlooked a serious point which made my results invalid so that was my first contact with Jerry. <laughs> <laughs> After initial dismay, I realized I must be grateful to Jerry for his thoughtfulness and collegiality. Not only did he pay attention to a paper by an unknown postdoc, a rare occurrence in our profession, but also having identified an error, he did not publicize it, which would be common in our profession. Rather than publicizing it, he communicated with me privately, which allowed me to withdraw the paper gracefully. When I returned from CERN and settled in Boston, I was happy to make Jerry's and Sue's acquaintance and enjoy their friendliness and modesty. 
I suspect it is Jerry's professional gentleness and modesty that caused his important work to be only minimally acknowledged for almost half a century. So let me discuss how the matter stood then and how it stands now. In the 1960s, there was no agreed upon model for describing elementary particles. While various proposed models resisted analysis because of their complexity. But there existed guiding principles that transcended any specific model. One such principle was gauge invariance, which ensures consistency of dynamics for vector bosons like photons and electrodynamics. Another desired feature was the presence of a high degree of symmetry. Symmetry both helped unravel the intricate dynamics in the proposed models and also controlled some of their inconsistencies. But since nature does not exhibit an overwhelming degree of symmetry, Heisenberg proposed an elegant mechanism wherein dynamical equations of the model possess symmetries, but the solutions do not. And this is called spontaneous symmetry breaking. However, both spontaneous symmetry breaking and gauge invariance were thought to require massless particles. The massless photons of gauge invariant electrodynamics providing evidence for the latter. Moreover, the association of a massless particle with spontaneous symmetry breaking was sanctified by Goldstone's theorem. But theorems require hypotheses. One should keep that in mind. The purported necessity of massless particles <coughs> stymied progress. One wanted to describe carriers of the weak force by gauge invariant vector fields. But weak forces are short range, so their carriers cannot be massless. Also, the massless bosons required by Goldstone's theorem are not present among the known elementary particles. Not everyone subscribed to this orthodoxy. In 1961, Schwinger constructed a model in which gauge invariance of a vector field does not necessarily imply zero mass for an associated particle. This was worked out in 61 and published in 62. But hardly any particle physicist paid attention to this, presumably because Schwinger's example was a, in one space and one time dimension and could not be used for model building. But the condensed matter physicist Anderson recognized a year later that Schwinger's proposal is realized in superconductivity. And he wrote a paper addressed to particle physicists in which he asserted that the boson, which is, appears a result of the theorem of Goldstone and his zero mass, is converted into a finite mass particle by interaction with the appropriate gauge field. The Goldstone zero mass difficulty is not serious because we can probably cancel it off against equal gauge field zero mass problem. Hardly any particle physicist paid attention to this, presumably because Schwinger's, uh, uh, because the language of condensed matter physics and the